evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, have any of you been to the previous two lectures? What do you think? I mean, are these fantastic lectures? We are so excited um, because one of the things we're learning is that the Gilded Age is a period of transformation. And wow, it is a wild, wild time. And that's what we've learned in the first two, and we have four more. Tonight, however, we're going to learn about vacationing during the Gilded Age. Um, I do want to thank all of you for supporting us, for being members. If you're not a member, consider joining us. Uh, let us know what you think we could do better. Uh, the Preservation Society is in its own period of transformation. We are trying to figure out how to tell history stories in a better, more innovative, more exciting way, and we would really love your advice on how to do that. So please weigh in and give us your suggestions. Um, we're excited because on the 18th of May, we have a great speaker coming to town. His name is TJ Stiles. TJ is a Pulitzer Prize winning biographer. He is going to be giving a lecture called The Age of the Machine, The Fight to Reinvent Democracy in the Gilded Age. Uh, TJ spoke to us here in Newport, um, I guess maybe 10 or 15 years ago. He wrote a phenomenal book about Cornelius Vanderbilt and did win a, a, a Pulitzer for that, for that book. And his expertise is within the arena of politics. And anyone who knows anything about the Gilded Age knows that politics during the Gilded Age was rambunctious and underhanded and crazy. So I'm really looking forward to hearing him. So please, if you haven't yet signed up, go to our website, get a ticket. And if you're on Zoom and cannot be in Newport, um, please join us that way as well. Uh, tonight, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Will B. McIntosh, who is an associate professor of history at the University of Mary Washington in Virginia. Dr. McIntosh is a cultural and social historian of the 19th century United States with particular interests in, get this, the history of leisure, the history of crime, and the cultural history of capitalism. I love this combination of things. One of his current projects deals with research on the Loomis Gang, a group of horse thieves in the 19th century New York. And maybe you'll tell us a little bit about the Loomis Gang tonight. In addition to his research, he's the editor of the Panorama, Extensive Views from the Journal of the Early Republic. He is also an author of Selling the Sights, The Invention of the Tourist, in American Culture, which was published by New York University Press in 2019. And if you're interested in learning more about tourism, you can pick up his book tonight. He will be here to not only uh, talk about it, but also to sign it if you're interested. Tonight, Dr. McIntosh joins us to present The Many Playgrounds of an Industrial Age. And he's going to introduce us to the many and diverse vacationing habits of Americans. And some of you already know what the major sites, destinations were from that period, everything from Newport to the Adirondacks, to Coney Island, to Martha's Vineyard, to the Catskills, Saratoga. Um, all of these places are places that we have either heard of or visited, so we'll learn more about what they were like 100 plus years ago. We do have time for questions and answers. The mic is a stationary mic over somewhere there. There, thank you, Kate. Uh, so please don't be afraid to step forward and ask your questions. We've had a lot of lively questions in the past two lectures, so you make it exciting, so make it even more exciting for us tonight. And then finally, before I ask Dr. McIntosh to come forward, I do want to recognize Kate Pedersen. Where are you, Kate? Because Kate has been organizing this series. Thank you, Kate. She's done a wonderful job. We, we have... Um, we have uh, done a lot of research into who the best speakers about Gilded Age history are. And uh, we've looked at thousands of speakers on YouTube and discarded many of them. And I think we've selected some really great winners. So Dr. McIntosh, you're really put to the test tonight. You better be good. <laughs> Thank you all very much for being here.
Thanks, Trudy, and thanks for that lovely introduction, and thank you, everyone. I, uh, I wasn't aware I was a YouTube star, but I, hopefully I can, this is be the beginning of a great career right here, perhaps. Um, who, who here is a fan of, of the Gilded Age TV show? I'm guessing a, a, you know, a large number of you are. Um, it's, it's a germane topic if you, if you live in Newport, I suppose, right? Um, and I thought about that, uh, started with that television show, and I wanted to work out from there and think about what are some of the kind of characteristics of the Gilded Age that em emerged for me when I was sitting on my couch watching that show. Um, and then I want to take those characteristics and think about how they actually shaped the leisure destinations of the Gilded Age, right? None of, I, none of these um, characteristics, I think, are unique to the Gilded Age, right? They, as, I'd be happy to talk about how many of them have important forerunners before. And of course, uh, a lot of the themes I'm gonna talk about tonight per, uh, persist considerably after the Gilded Age, right? Well into the 20th century um, and into our own, right? But I think that they are in some ways uh, uniquely and specially characteristic of the Gilded Age. So I wanna talk about four. I'm gonna talk about these uh, a little bit um, to begin with, right? Why, I, um, what I mean by these, these four themes. Right? Uh, and then I want to turn to, for each of these themes, I'm going to pick out a couple of important vacation destinations from the Gilded Age that I think sort of illustrate the points I'm trying to make right, about, about what uh, vacationing was like in the Gilded Age. Um, the first characteristic I want to uh, pick out is that the Gilded Age was the age of the railroad. I don't think I need to tell you that, right? We're sitting here uh, in this beautiful space built with the money of the New York Central Railroad, right? Um, as were many of these houses in Newport were built with, with railroad money. Um, the first transcontinental railroad opened in, in 1869. Um, and though you know, railroads were an existing technology before the Gilded Age, right, that opening of, of the Transcontinental Railroad uh, sparked a really massive boom um, in railroad construction in the 1870s, especially in the 1880s, um, when there were more than 70,000 miles of track laid down in a, in a decade, just construction on an absolutely massive scale. And these railroads, both transcontinental and otherwise, produced massive fortunes, right, like we can see around us, um, also produced enormous economic instability, right, that they required quite a, deal, uh, quite a bit of financial leverage to build these things. Um, and it created an economy, right, that was, that was uh, quite unstable, right, particularly by the standards of our time. The booms were boomy and the busts were busty, right? <laughs> um, that theme kind of ties to my second one, right? That the Gilded Age, it was an age of both wealth and also, importantly, of income inequality, right? The, the fortunes produced by the railroads and the other characteristic industrial ventures of the Gilded Age, right, were, were enormous, right? Unprecedented in their scope and scale in American history. It's really hard to actually estimate the degree of wealth and also the degree of income inequality uh, before the income tax was implemented, which didn't come until 1909, right? So this, we don't have a lot of data, right? But um, for our best guess, right, there's something like the richest 4,000 families of the 1890s had the same amount of wealth as the bottom uh, almost 12 million families, right? So that's the kind of um, gap in, the kind of wealth gap that is, you know, actually characteristic of the age that we live in now, right? In some ways, it was very similar to the age we live in now in terms of the, the real, uh, sharp juxtapositions between uh, wealth and, and poverty. Um, the Gilded Age, as I want to suggest, was also an age of, of mechanical wonder, right? It's the era of the triumph of the steam engine. Again, the steam engine, not a Gilded Age invention. It goes back to the 1780s, right? Um, and the steam engine had been applied to a lot of important um, economic and technological problems before the Gilded Age. But really, the Gilded Age is the era, I think, in which the steam engine comes into its own, right? Both as a, as a means of transportation, particularly for railroads um, and for shipping, um, as well as a sort of source of industrial power. That's very much characteristic of the Gilded Age as well. Um, it's also the era of the birth of electricity, right? It's, it's, the tr it's the sort of apotheosis of steam and the birth of electricity, you might think of it, right? Um, and the, particularly the invention of electricity, I think, uh, or the, it's not the invention of electricity, but the, the sort of the invention of the technical know-how needed to harness electricity to make it do things, right? Sparks an, an enormous age of invention, right? The telephone in 1876, the incandescent light bulb in 1879, um, 
uh, electrified streetcars in 1888, which transformed the landscape of our cities, right? Um, other important inventions included like the phonograph, right? The automobile, of course, invented in, in 1886, the airplane in 1903, right? So it's a period of, of very rapid technological um, innovation, right? And then fourth, right, of course, the Gilded Age is characteristically an age of segregation. Um, and in a way that I think sometimes is challenging for us as contemporary Americans to think about, right? Because I think we are often used to thinking of American history as being a sort of story of progress, right? From sort of darkness to light, right? From, from less uh, uh, equality to greater equality, from, from exclusion to inclusion. Um, but in some really important ways, the Gilded Age was an era of backsliding in terms of, um, of civil rights for, for Americans. Um, Reconstruction, of course, ended in 1877, right, as a result of the contested election in 1876. So federal uh, troops withdrew from the former Confederate states in, in 1877, um, which launched a 20-year project of constructing Jim Crow states across the South, uh, a process that most historians um, sort of, uh, date, they date the, 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 cons the completion of that process, right? The complete construction of a Southern Jim Crow regime to the, um, to the, uh, the uh, coup in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898, right? When a, when a group of uh, uh, white men uh, used uh, murder and violence to push out a duly elected black government, right? So, um, and sort of the, the period that we think of as the Gilded Age is a period in which Jim Crow is aggressively expanding across the southern landscape. Of course, right, it was the, the North was not, um, uh, was not exempt from that, right? The, the, um, the particular legal mechanisms by which segregation emerged in the North were different than they were in the South, right? Um, but uh, life became considerably less integrated for Americans over the course of the uh, uh, 1880s and the 1890s and into the 20th century. Um, it's of course the era of lynching, right? Again, lynching not invented in the Gilded Age and it continued afterwards, right? But the, in terms of uh, the actual death toll of the kinds of political violence that enforced segregation really peaks in the 1890s, right? Um, it's an era of rising uh, anti-immigrant backlash. Um, immigration picks up very quickly in the 1870s, um, and it picks up quickly um, from uh, parts of the world that, um, that were, had not sent a lot of uh, immigrants to the United States previous to the Civil War. Um, Eastern and Southern Europe, um, East Asia, right, in particular. Um, uh, an enormous number of immigrants coming in in the 1880s and the 1890s, really culminating in the, in the Immigration Act of 1924, which shut a lot of the, uh, which sort of shut America's doors in a, in a very dramatic way. Um, so uh, on the home front, right, and particularly um, in, in sort of the urban East Coast, it's a period of real anti-immigrant backlash um, as, as uh, sort of immigrant populations are growing um, very rapidly in the cities, right? So, age of technological wonder, right? An age characterized by the dominant characteristic technology, the railroad, right? An era of enormous wealth, right? Also enormous poverty, right? And an era, I think, in which um, uh, might, can be fairly characterized as a backsliding era in terms of, of uh, civil and political rights for most Americans. Okay, I wanna turn now to the first of my themes, right? The age of the railroad to talk about um, how the railroad shaped vacationing um, in the Gilded Age, right? Um, I have a map here from 18, on the screen, it's a map from 1890 um, of, of the railroads in the United States. And you can see just the density of the capillaries, right? Um, particularly on the East Coast um, and, the, and in the upper Midwest. Um, transportation technologies really shaped where people could go on vacation. That seems like a sort of truism, <laughs> right, seems kind of obvious, right? How can you go places on vacation unless you can get there? Um, but I think that the really critical thing to understand about the railroad as a technology of, um, of vacationing is that it meant that it, it, in some ways, it made it really easy to get to a certain number of places and actually very difficult to get any, to um, a much wider number of places. It would, with Gilded Age transportation technology, with the kind of railroad network that you see there, there's a whole array of places that all of a sudden are 
cheaply, easily, and quickly accessible to people who are looking to get away um, and have a vacation. But all the blank spots on the map, right, sort of counterintuitively become further away, right, um, by virtue of not having railroad access. So railroads um, f serve to really concentrate vacation activity in particular spots, right, and usually particular spots that are favored by, that have favored railroad access. Railroads also, by virtue of their fixed schedules, um, make it, um, it is easy and cheap to get someplace when you're, when you're on a schedule, but it, it's sort of hard to be um, impulsive, right, when you're getting around on a railroad, which meant that people had a real incentive to go someplace and stay there. Right, so vacations, the, the sort of the notion of the tour, right, or the road trip, right, um, that we think of as being characteristic of a lot of family vacations in the 20th and the 21st century, you don't see a lot of that in the Gilded Age because it wasn't, it was, it was incredibly convenient to go to one place and stay there, but incredibly inconvenient to go from place to place to place, right? Um, so you might think of the Gilded Age in a lot of ways as really the golden era of the resort. Right? And by a resort, I mean a place that is built to cater to vacationers. Right? It is a place that is purpose-built purpose -built for play. Um, and it is, it's a place where you go and you stay for a while. Right? You enjoy yourself in some of the characteristic ways that I'll, I'll talk about um, in these different resorts. Um, and then you go home. Right? So the railroad, I think, you might think of the railroad as being incredibly formative in, in creating the idea of the resort as the central site of vacationing for most Americans. Right? You chose a place, a place that usually had a reason for you to go there, had an activity or a set of activities that was associated with it. You went, you stayed, you did your vacation, then you went home. Right? Um, I want to start talking a little bit about Saratoga Springs. Saratoga Springs has, has, a, has a deeper history, right? It is, it, it is a vacation destination. It is a resort um, before the era of the railroad, right? The, um, the very first um, uh, uh, hotels get constructed in, in Saratoga um, right at the turn of the 19th century, right? Super early. You know, people are still getting there um, in stagecoaches. Um, the attraction of Saratoga, of course, is that it's a, uh, a valley that has a series of mineral springs in it, uh, a series of mineral springs that are, that are um, uh, it, it's a somewhat unique geological formation because the springs are a little bit different from each other, but they're in quite close proximity. So you can go there, you can drink different kinds of mineral water with different mineral, um, uh, with different mineral content in one place, right, without going from, from place to place. Um, it's otherwise unremarkable, right? It's sort of a flat, sandy plain with like a small valley in it. It's not a place that you would go to for its natural beauty particularly, right? Um, but it does have this unique geological feature that um, attracts people. And so, um, you know, uh, people begin going there to take the waters, right, which is a, a sort of a combination of health and leisure, right? It's a, it's a uh, practice that has deep European roots, of course, Right, of going to, going to Bath, right, or going to Baden-Baden to in Europe, right? And um, in the very first years of the American Republic, right, there's an emerging elite class of Americans who are looking to um, replicate European models of leisure. And, and Saratoga uh, becomes one of the places uh, uh, that, um, that does that. I have a picture on the upper left there. That's, I think, from the, I want to say that's from the 1860s. It gives you a sense it's got a park. Um, it's got the, the sort of springs um, that are underneath those, those Grecian pavilions, um, and then a sort of landscape of, of luxury hotels um, that surrounding the park and, and radiating out from it on, on, along the, the streets of the village. Um, Saratoga is not the only place right, that has mineral springs and that is trying in the beginning of the 19th century to, um, uh, to attract um, summer leisure visitors with money to spend. Um, but Saratoga just happens to early on get convenient railroad connection to Albany, which is not far away, which itself has convenient and frequent um, steamboat connections to, to New York City. Right? Um, and uh, soon railroad connections as well. The, the railroad gets to Saratoga in 1832. Um, this is an image of, of the first train station um, in Saratoga. As you can see, it's not a very, uh, it's not a very um, elaborate structure, right? But I think you could argue that Saratoga really um, uh, sort of grows by leaps and bounds over and above other American mineral springs um, destinations because it's so easy to get there on the railroad, right? Or at least it's easy to get there on the railroad from the enormous uh, wealth generation 
generating metropolises of the East Coast, right? Um, so 1832 is when they get that connection. Um, by the 1870s, uh, it's uh, better integrated into the Northeastern um, uh, uh, Railroad network. This is the the Delaware and Hudson station there from the from the early 1870s. Um, and and I like this image because it, it illustrates uh, something that shows up frequently in accounts uh, of people who visit Saratoga in the Gilded Age, right? Which is that going to meet the train is an important part of the social ritual of your vacation, right? You go down to the train station to meet the morning train coming in to see who the newcomers are, right? Um, see who's showing up, who's leaving, right? What eligible bachelors are, are arriving, right? That kind of thing. Um, and this, it, this illustration from the 1870s, I think really, um, really captures the, 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 the social scene at the heart of the, of the train station. Um, so Saratoga was not invented by the railroad. Um, but I think it is an important illustration of the significance of the railroad for creating vacation destinations. But what you see in the Gilded Age with new vacation destinations is that, um, is that the, the construction of railroads and the construction of tourist resorts actually often go hand in hand, often done by the same people. Um, I want to talk now about, the, about uh, Henry Flagler. Right um, and the and the early origins of of uh, vacationing uh, on the east coast of Florida in in uh, St Augustine and, and particularly in Palm Beach, um, Henry Flagler was a um, uh, a vice uh, he was a partner in Standard Oil right made a lot of money. Um, uh, his wife was ailing in the late 1870s and early 1880s, and they spend the winter of, of 1881 um, with a friend um, in St. Augustine for her health. Um, her doctor had told her to go get sort of a mild climate for the winter. Um, she dies not very long after that. I guess the mild climate doesn't do its thing. Um, he remarries, but he gets very interested in this idea that you could create a kind of winter equivalent of Saratoga in the South, right? That, that elites from the, from the North, right, might not only want to get away um, in the, in the uh, summer, but they might also want to get away in the winter too. And that Florida uh, might have, and particularly St. Augustine, right, which is a historic city, might have the kind of perfect, um, be the kind of perfect uh, uh, southern equivalent to places like Saratoga or, dare I say, um, Newport. Um, but of course, it's hard to get there. So the first thing Flagler does um, is um, in the, uh, uh, mid-1880s, um, is he begins to assemble um, a bunch of short-line railroads um, into what he calls the Florida East Coast Railway, right? He gets a bunch of sort of existing short-line railroads um, in South Georgia and in Northeast Florida, uh, connects them together, and begins to extend them down the East Coast in the Florida East Coast Railway. Um, and he, for him, this is a very conscious strategy, right? That if he's going to attract people uh, to come down from the north and spend a month or two for the winter um, in the enormous hotels that he's constructing. Um, this is the, the Ponce de Leon in, um, uh, in St. Augustine. Um, that it needs to be, they need to be able to get in their Pullman car in New York or in Philadelphia or in Chicago and you know, wake up uh, a day or a day and a half later um, in St. Augustine, right? He needs to make it easy to get there on the railroads. So he invests a lot in the railroads. Um, and so for him, this is, he's doing these two things simultaneously because he understands that, that connection. Um, he pushes the, the Florida East Coast Railway further down the East Coast. Um, by the 1890s, he's developing uh, Palm Beach, right? Uh, the railroad has gotten down that far. Um, this is a hotel um, uh, that opened, uh, that was uh, uh, built in 1894 called the, the Royal Poinciana Hotel. I, I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce that, I have to say. Um, the Royal Poinciana Hotel in, in Palm Beach. Um, and this image from 1895, I particularly like because you can see the railway like literally comes up to the door of the hotel, right? Like Flagler is making it as easy as possible, right? <laughs> For people um, to show up at the doorway of his hotel. Um, this hotel is on Palm Beach Island, but it's actually on the, on the lagoon side. It's not on the ocean side. Um, a, a year or two later, he builds a, a second hotel on, on the, um, on the ocean side um, that I think he first calls the Palm Beach Inn or something very gene generic, but everyone keeps saying, I want to stay over by the breakers. And so he just renames it the breakers, right? Um, and that one, it burns down a couple of times, at least once, right? But there is a, still a, a hotel called the breakers um, on the spot today, though it's not the, it's not the original Flagler one. Um, so as you can see, right, for, for a guy like Flagler, right, he understands this connection. He's doing them, doing them both together. I think I, I want to 
give you one final example, um, because it, it's a little bit outside the Gilded Age, or at least the Gilded Age tightly defined, but I think it's in, in some ways it's like the apotheosis of this railroad slash uh, resort strategy. Um, and that's the story of the creation of Glacier National Park. Right, uh, Glacier National Park is in uh, western Montana, all the way up north um, along the Canadian border, um, uh, uh, sort of on the, the eastern slope of the Rockies. Um, and in, um, in the late 1880s and the 1890s, um, there's a, 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 there, um, a new transcontinental railroad that's trying to forge its way between uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, and Puget Sound. It's called, it's called the Great Northern, they call it, it's called the Great Northern Railway. Um, and it, it crosses the, the Rockies right up by the Canadian border, right? Um, uh, uh, it's sort of where Montana and British Columbia and Idaho all come together. Um, the Great Northern has a, has a problem, though, as a transcontinental railroad, which is that there is another transcontinental railroad not very far to the south called the Northern Pacific, which has existed for, for a while at this point, right? Um, uh, and uh, it connects Chicago and, and Puget Sound. And, um, and so it's not like super clear that the Great Northern has a reason to exist. Right, because it, it is not very far away from, from the Northern Pacific. It, it parallels it quite closely. Um, but the, the, the business people coming out of, out of St. Paul who want to, they, they want their own transcontinental railroad, and by God, they're going to build it even if there isn't actually business for it. So the Great Northern, from the, from the beginning, faces a challenge of how do you get people to actually like, ride this railroad um, uh, over the Northern Pacific, which is, which is not far away. Um, and so um, as the, when they reach the, the, the eastern slope of the Rockies, which happens um, in, in 1891, uh, they immediately began, uh, they began kind of publicizing this area widely across the east as, quote, America's Switzerland. They keep calling it the Switzerland of America, right? Um, I mean, if anyone's been there, it is, it is gorgeous, right? I mean, they're not wrong, right? Um, but they, they, they see um, vacationers, right, as a potential um, uh, uh, source of business, right, um, that they can use over the uh, um, over the um, the Northern Pacific. The Northern Pacific, though, was also in on this game because the Northern Pacific runs right by the doorway of Yellowstone National Park, right? And the, the Northern Pacific had already gotten um, uh, sort of already gotten its claws in the promotion of Yellowstone, um, and so uh, the Great Northern needs its own its own national park to compete with with uh, uh, Yellowstone. So they begin lobbying. Uh, they give a they they lobby very hard, and they give a bunch of money to this uh, sort of club of elite sportsmen called the Boone and Crockett Club who then use that money to, to lean very hard on Congress to declare um, uh, that area um, a national park. Um, and and they, they succeed, right? In 1897, it becomes a forest preserve. Um, and then finally, it, it actually becomes a national park in, in 1910, right? But this, in this case, the railroad uh, um, and its allies are, are devoting enormous amount of lobbying power to get the, the federal government to make this a national park um, as part of their... their um, uh, their growth strategy. Um, once it becomes a national park in 1910, um, they charter a, a subsidiary called the Glacier Park Company that begins building lodges and hotels uh, throughout the park. Um, they begin running um, these bus lines within the park, right? Um, uh, this is the Glacier Park Transportation Company, also a subsidiary of, of the Great Northern, um, to take tourists around and show them the, the various glaciers and the other sort of features of the park. Um, and, and these uh, structures that they construct um, are, are, very, are completely oriented towards the railroads, right? They, are, um, they, are, they have stations, conveniently, uh, on the uh, Great Northern, right? Uh, and they're built in a sort of like grandiose rustic style um, to, to sort of uh, fit the branding of Switzerland of America. A lot of them look like chalets from the outside. Um, and so, I, you know, this is a little bit outside the Gilded Age, but it, for me, this really encapsulates the way in which the railroads and vacationing are just deeply intertwined with each other um, in the Gilded Age, up to and including, right, uh, sort of uh, bribing Congress to create national parks as a business strategy, right? Okay, I want to talk a little bit in, uh, uh, more about the, the age of, of, of wealth uh, and inequality. Um, as, as a, and the way in which the wealth and the inequality of the Gilded Age shaped uh, people's vacationing experiences. I want to start in Newport, which I probably don't, I'm not going to spend much time telling you guys about the history of Newport, um, uh, particularly not as a, as a, as a vacation destination. Um, 
you know, it, after the American Revolution, right, Newport has, it goes into a little bit of an economic slump, right? It becomes a little bit of a backwater at the beginning of the 19th century. Um, you know, it, it, uh, it and um, the sort of, they, Locals figure out how to play this sort of backwaterness, turn it into quaintness in the 1830s and the 1840s, and begin to attract people to come, you know, and, and spend a summer in a little slice of old New England, which has been conveniently bypassed by modernity. Um, they wish they wish they had not been bypassed by modernity, but they were, um, and, and they, uh, uh, you know, turn this into an asset, right? Um, and it becomes, you know, a, a place that sort of attracts southern elites, right? Um, elite uh, wealthy enslavers from particularly South Carolina, um, as well as sort of local New England elites um, through the, the, the Civil War and into the, into the early Gilded Age. And then of course, in, in the 1890s explodes, right? As, as a destination uh, for the wealthiest uh, of the wealthy Americans. Um, the thing that I think is, is um, notable about Newport, and, and in, in particular contrast to, to a place like Saratoga, right, is the way in which um, Newport offered a, uh, elites um, a high degree of social control over, over their surroundings um, when they were vacationing, right? If you're a wealthy person in the 1890s or the 1900s, right, um, I, I suppose if you're a wealthy person um, ever, right, I think that, that um, a lot of them are very much on their guard of that, about people in their social circle, um, particularly people who are trying to get things from them, right, people who may not be <laughs> who they seem, right, um, or people who have particular agendas around them uh, regarding their wealth, right? So it becomes a really important uh, sort of cultural value of the Gilded Age elite to um, exercise very strong uh, sort of, uh, social control is not quite the right word, right? Because that sounds sort of more Machiavellian than it is, right? But to, but to kind of police access to their social circles and to control access to their social circles in ways that allowed them to, to vet people who were coming in and to their, to their social circles, right? Because, because there was, in fact, so much materially at stake um, these people were so wealthy. Um, and in this picture of the breakers, um, uh, uh, um, I, I, the thing that strikes me about this image is just the enormous moat of lawn around it, right? The way in which the quote unquote cottages of Newport, right, had, had in a sense like these sort of, these strong social defenses on them, right? They aren't literal moats, right, but these, the, there are actual walls, right? But, but the, these enormous sort of expanses of lawn and all the kinds of social cues that came with going to visit one of the cottages, right, and crossing that lawn and presenting yourself, um, allowed Newport to give, uh, allowed, allowed Gilded Age elites to have that kind of control over their social circle that wasn't as possible in a place like Saratoga, right, where everyone's staying in a hotel, or most people are staying in hotels, um, and, and it's much more urban, right, much more give and take. Right, you see that in the architecture of the cottages here, right? That I, I think it's an architecture of, of, of uh, social regulation, right? Um, you see that in the institutions that the elite build in, in Newport, right? Institutions like the casino, right? Which I think is a really interestingly sort of quasi-public, quasi-private uh, space, right? It, it's, it's, it's not completely private but it's also not completely public, right? So it's a way in which um, this elite can, can exist in public, but maintain those kinds of controls, right? About who's, who's with them and who's approaching them, right? So you can see that kind of char that characteristic in the, um, uh, in the institutions that they build here. But the thing I would point out about something like the casino, right? Is that, you know, even if the inside is, is socially managed space, right? It's a city outside, right? Newport is still a city. They, they aren't plunking themselves down in the middle of nowhere. They are plunking themselves down in the middle of a, of, of a city that includes people who were here before them and would be here after them, and it, people of, um, from all over the world, right? And people of different social classes and people, um, right? So, so that, that degree, I think, of, of uh, control over sociability that the Gilded Age elite really desires, um, they can do a lot of that in Newport, right? But Newport is, in fact, still a city with its own life, right? With its own economy, with its own things going on above and beyond, right, the, the elite who, who uh, choose to vacation here. So, so how do you solve that problem if you're a Gilded Age elite? Go even further away. Get yourself into the wilderness, right? Um, get yourself as far away as you can um, uh, in, into space that it's, is um, where, where you can manage um, sociability 
through like distance and wilderness, right? I'm of course talking about, about the Adirondacks um, in upstate New York. The, um, the vogue for going to the Adirondacks, um, uh, it really uh, sort of bursts onto the scene um, in 1870. Um, and, and the story, as the story goes, right, um, uh, there was a, a minister from Boston named W.H.H. H. Murray who goes on a, a camping trip, um, a camping and hunting trip in the Adirondacks um, in like, 1868. Um, and he writes a book about it, right? It's sort of a, it, it's, it's not a very serious book, honestly, right? It's just sort of a slapdash memoir about this hunting trip called Adventures in the Wilderness. Uh, it gets published in 1869 and somehow becomes this like runaway bestseller, right? People get really um, into Murray's stories of like, uh, you know, sort of quaint French Canadian guides and like crazy mosquitoes and pulling giant fish out of remote lakes and slaughtering deer, right? It, it just hits a nerve um, when it comes out um, and crea creates this um, uh, sort of uh, vogue for vacate, doing, doing these sort of sporting, uh, hunting, fishing, camping vacations in the Adirondacks. Um, this is a, a cartoon from Harper's in um, uh, 1870, kind of commenting on this phenomenon, right? The rush for the wilderness. Um, uh, this, that's a, one of the kinder captions, right? Uh, often um, in sort of cultural commentary on these people, they're referred to as Murray's fools, right? They, they sort of like uh, p city, city slickers wander around the Adirondacks not knowing what they're doing. In the early 1870s, they're often called Murray's fools. Um, and, uh, and very quickly, um, uh, sort of the Gilded Age elite realizes the, the, the possibilities of, of the Adirondacks as, as a summer space of leisure. Um, on the upper left there um, is a picture of um, a, a man named um, W.W. Durant. Yes, it's W.H.H. H. Murray and W. Du Everyone's got lots of W's. W.W. Um, w. Durant, William West Durant. Um, his father was uh, Thomas Durant, um, who was uh, one of the partners in the Union Pacific Railroad, right? So another railroad fortune. Um, and uh, his son, uh, and um, Thomas Durant in the um, 1870s is poking around in the Adirondacks thinking about railroad construction. He doesn't really have uh, uh, leisure or vacationing on his mind. He's trying to get to iron mines. There's a, there's a sort of region in the central Adirondacks that has good um, iron mines. And so he's trying to get to the iron mines. So, um, uh, the son, W.W. Uh, Durant, gets interested in the Adirondacks as part of the sort of business, business venture of his father's um, and, begins, and uh, begins constructing these, these getaway, comp these sort of vacation compounds. This, that is him uh, in the mid-1870s on the upper left there descending the steps at his first uh, so-called camp, which was called Pine Knot on Racket Lake in, uh, in the central Adirondacks. Um, Durant and his followers called these places camps right? Um, but they were anything but, right? They were, they were much more like small villages. Um, it was characteristic of the camp style of architecture that, um, uh, that they were spread across multiple buildings, right? Um, so rather, so there was sleeping buildings, um, there was kitchen buildings, there was dining room buildings, there were sort of hangout buildings. Um, uh, Durant famously had, had a barge with a, like sort of a tea house on it that he hauled out into the middle of the lake to anchor to get away from the mosquitoes, um, <laughs> right? So, so that kind of thing. Um, so these places actually looked more like sort of villages, these little clusters of, of rustic cabins, right? Um, and, and he, you know, used very, um, very sort of ostentatiously rustic materials, right? It was a lot of unpeeled logs. Um, the furniture was made out of, a lot of the furniture was made out of twigs, right? It was sort of that kind of look. Um, but these were um, sort of luxury mini resorts, right, for rich families to, to stay in by themselves. Um, Durant himself uh, went on to sell Pine Knot to Collis B. Huntington, right, of, of the, uh, um, uh, uh, California. Oh God, Southern Pacific, right? Um, he went on, to, and then Durant himself went on to build a couple of other of these. Um, and he was not the only one, right? He he sparked a whole generation of um, uh, of uh, builders and architects who built these kinds of um, uh, rustic but increasingly luxurious uh, compounds in the Adirondacks um, for people to for uh, the Gilded Age elite to uh, get away uh, get away in. Uh, on the lower right there is a house called Sagamore um, that Durant built. Um, uh, in the mid 1890s, um, at, so after Pine Knot, um, it's on its own lake. <coughs> um, 
And that house he actually sold to um, Alfred Vanderbilt, right, the son of, um, uh, the, who grew up in this house, um, who bought it um, in like 1902, something like that, right, um, as a present to himself for graduating from Yale, right, and you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I got a nice dinner, I don't know, like, but he, he got, you know, 10,000 acres and, and like a luxury lodge that was like a village, right? Um, uh, the sort of the, the elite spent their time and, at these Adirondack quote unquote camps, right? Um, they, they entertained a lot, right? Because they were in the middle of nowhere, they brought their friends, right? So um, compared, to, to, compared to a place like Newport, right? It was much more of a sort of hosting scene, right? And these places often had like, you know, whole villages of guest cottages because you would bring your friends to stay for an extended period of time. Um, there was a lot of water sports, right? On the upper left there you see um, uh, there's a kind of characteristic design of a boat um, called a guide boat um, that, that is indigenous to the Adirondacks. Um, that people, it looks like a canoe, but it's a road um, that, that uh, people spend a lot of time on. And, and you know, hunting and, and other kinds of, hunting and fishing, right, were also uh, important critical things that they, that they did. Uh, the Adirondacks was not like just for um, was not just for um, rich people though, right? Um, middle class people to go there too, right? I mean, in a, in a more modest way, right? Um, and you know, it's it's interesting thinking about this sort of um, post 1870s rush to the wilderness, right? Because it is one of these moments in which people who are not the richest of the rich are beginning to get access to to vacations, right? Because you know, say what you will about a, a rustic lean-to, it's it is affordable, right? <laughs> And I, so I want to talk about, I want to turn to that for a moment, right? Because, because we have mostly talked about rich people so far. And that, there's a reason for that, right? Because rich people were the ones who could afford to go on vacation, especially in the Gilded Age, right? They were the ones with the, with the money to travel. Um, but increasingly, but in, in the money is less and less of a problem in the Gilded Age, right? Thanks to technologies like the railroads. Importantly, rich people are the ones who have the leisure to travel. Right, like vacation, like paid time off is not a thing right, for working people in the Gilded Age, right? So it's, it's as much a time thing as a money thing, right? But that doesn't mean that there weren't people beginning to think about um, vacations for, um, for the, uh, for the non-wealthy, right? I should say this is also, uh, I wanna take a, a brief digression here into, um, into uh, uh, sort of Gilded Age, um, uh, medical theory about why this was too, right? Um, sort of Gilded Age medicine held that, that um, people uh, relied on a kind of fixed stock of nervous energy to live their lives, right? They, they understood well enough that the nervous system relied on electricity, but they didn't understand it well, they, they, but they misunderstood the function of the nervous system. They thought of the human body very much like a battery, right? That you had a sort of a fixed reserve of nerve energy that sort of dro drove you in life. Um, and if you used too much of it, right, you would become ill, right? You could, and neurasthenia was the name of the disease, right? It was essentially sort of like depletion of nerve energy. And they thought this was something that, quote unquote, brain workers were particularly subject to, right? People who worked with their bodies were not thought to be subject to, to nervous exhaustion, right? Because exercise replenished your nerve energy. But people who did brain work, i.e. rich people, right? <laughs> were the ones who needed to rest so that they didn't deplete their stock of nervous energy, right? So there's sort of like a medical theory, uh, I should say a self-serving medical theory, right? Considering it's <laughs> doctors who were brain workers who were coming up with this, a sort of self-serving medical theory about why it is that, that working people, manual laborers, didn't need vacations because they weren't running down their stock of nervous energy um, by, because they were working with their bodies, right? But you begin to see that, some people begin to question that, right, in the Gilded Age, right? <laughs> Particularly, it gets questioned for, for women and for children first, right? There's not a lot of efforts to figure out how to get vacations for working men yet in the, in the 19th century. That's not really a phenomenon until like the 1930s and the 1940s. Um, but already for, for women and children, right? There are particularly some reformers who are beginning to think that yet, yeah, like vacations might be good for them, right? And that has a medical reason too, right? Because female neurasthenia was thought to present as, um, as barrenness, right? That if women worked too hard or depleted their nerve energy, they weren't they wouldn't be able to have children, right? It's not true, right? But this is what they thought. Um, and so, you know, they thought that particularly working women could, could use 
rest in order to ensure that they could continue to be mothers going into the future, right? And then, of course, particularly poor children became a subject of, um, of uh, sort of philanthropy. You know, get them out of the city in the summer, get them into the wholesome air of the countryside, right? Um, and this is something that social reformers did because they understood it as a way to try to um, uh, uh, fix a sort of uh, urban social problems, right? So you see uh, institutions like this. This is. Um, a vacation house for, for working women um, opened at Monmouth Beach on the Jersey Shore by the YWCA. This is from 1881, right? And so the YWCA uh, opened this sort of a boarding house on the beach, and it was meant for working women, right? For women who worked in, in, in service or who worked in, in industry. Um, and, and for a subsidy, it, they had to pay, but it was cheap, right? It was subsidized. They could go and spend two weeks uh, by the beach, right? So you do see sort of philanthropic efforts of getting um, uh, uh, vacations for working people uh, in the 1880s. Um, this is the um, Children's Aid so Society of New York um, uh, summer house for, for tenement children. Um, it's at uh, Coney Island. Uh, this picture is from the early 20th century, but this uh, uh, institution was created in the 1880s also. Um, and it was, you know, uh, trying to get children out of sort of tenement districts and allowed them to spend a week or two by the, by the beach in the summer. So you do see um, uh, some, uh, some um, some attempts to, to address that from reformers, but they are small and they don't, uh, most people don't, most working people don't get these opportunities. Um, most working people, right, if they want to uh, spend a little bit of leisure time, they get away for the day, right, on a Saturday or more likely on a Sunday, right, because a lot of them are actually working on Saturdays. Um, in places like Coney Island, right, and I want to talk about Coney Island as, as, a, as a site where the age of mechanical wonder becomes an age of mechanical play, right? Coney Island explodes as a kind of day trip destination for working class New Yorkers um, in the 1870s um, when the, uh, the railway, which is the sort of, will become the forerunner of the New York subway, makes it out as far as Coney Island. So once, once the train actually goes there in the early 1870s, uh, it becomes a place that um, uh, working, working New Yorkers right, can get to for, for a, a, summer week, a summer weekend day for, you know, for, for a few cents worth of, of, of train fare. The attraction, of course, um, is the beach, right? This picture from the 1890s showing the beach. And, you know, it was not unusual on, on summer Sundays um, in the 1890s to have hundreds of thousands of people on the beach in Coney Island, right? It was just absolutely, we get absolutely packed, right? Um, but the attraction also, I think, was increasingly, right, the kind of mechanical amusements, right, of, of Coney Island. Um, on the right there, um, uh, I get, that's a picture of the, the charmingly named Elephantine Colossus. Um, it was actually a hotel, and it had like a bar and a tea room, and you could stay in it. Uh, that was built in 1885, and you can see it's wrapped around with a roller coaster, right? So Coney Island very quickly becomes a place where um, entrepreneurs experiment with all the cutting edge technologies of the Gilded Age, right? The railroads, the electricities, the new construction techniques, that kind of thing. But they turn them to the purposes of play rather than to the purposes of production, right? And I think that's why such a such a, uh, Coney Island is such a fascinating place, right? Because it's, it's all the sort of technological uh, experimentation, all the technological marvels of the Gilded Age, but applied towards pure frivolity, right? Uh, on the upper left there is, is a ride called Shoot the Shoots. Um, that picture is from the early 1890s. Um, and it's basically a kind of uh, artificial lagoon and you get put in these kind of big wooden flat boats and hauled up and you go shooting down. It's basically like a water slide in a wooden boat and then you hit the water and there's this huge splash and everybody gets wet and it's a, it's a good time, right? <laughs> um, so there's a lot of stuff like that. Um, Coney Island becomes the place where um, uh, many working people encounter electricity for the first time in a big way. On the upper left there is, is a, a large amusement park in Coney Island called Luna Park, uh, which opens in 1903, um, which is, you know, uh, famous for its illumination, right? And it was said that you could see Luna Park from Manhattan at night, right? It was, it was lit up so brightly that you could see Luna Park from Manhattan. Um, and so it's a place where, where electricity, right, um, becomes, becomes a, a tool of play, right, for working people. Um, in the lower right here, this is just, this is my particular favorite. Um, I don't know if you can see it. Um, uh, it says baby incubators on that building there. Um, Coney Island, it becomes a place where um, uh, uh, doctors experiment with early um, 
uh, sort of prenatal incubator technology. Hospi there, there are doctors who, who uh, think that they can develop these machines to keep premature babies alive, but most hospitals don't want anything to do, it, to do with it, but the amusement park creators in Coney Island are like, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and so they build these um, display, display rooms full of um, baby incubators, and that women who, are, who give birth prematurely will go to Coney Island, right, and, they, put, and they, they, they have doctors there that keep the babies alive in these incubators um, as sort of an exhibit. Right, um, and again, this is like that's that whole theme of sort of technological marvel. Look what we can do now. We can build these machines that keep premature babies alive, right? Um, and and you can come and see it. Come see the little teeny tiny babies in their in their glass boxes. Yeah, uh, one imagines that the mothers were probably grateful for for any help that they could get in in that circumstance. Um, my final theme here, I want to talk a little bit about about segregation, right, and the way in which vacations in the, in the Gilded Age were segregated, and importantly, were increasingly segregated, right? Um, in, the, um, <clears throat> in 1875, uh, so this is right before the end of Reconstruction, right? Um, Congress passes the Civil Rights Bill. Um, and it's actually, the Civil Rights Bill is quite comprehensive. Right. Um, it, it, it is, in some ways, really echoes the civil rights bills that we passed in the 1960s uh, in terms of outlawing discrimination and all different kinds of accommodations uh, on the basis of, of, of race and religion and things like that. Um, unfortunately, the Supreme Court struck it down in 1883. Right? The Supreme Court in 1883 says that the 14th Amendment right, only applies to governments. It doesn't apply to private citizens. So private citizens are free to discriminate um, even if they're offering accommodations to the public however they want. Right? This clears the, the legal path for Jim Crow, right? the, this um, declaration of the Civil Rights Act unconstitutional. And I think that's really um, sort of sets the stage for the, for the story of segregation um, in the Gilded Age, which is that in the 1870s and the 1880s, right, a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, oops, uh, you know, the, Leisure de destinations, at least these working class ones, right, are reasonably integrated. But over the course of particularly the 1880s and especially the 1890s, right, African Americans get pushed out of um, the leisure, uh, uh, leisure spaces that are being increasingly uh, framed as, as exclusively for whites, right? Um, and they do that at, through essentially sort of businessman's rights. Like I said, right, Jim Crow in the North doesn't look like Jim Crow in the South, right? It's not generally a legal regime in the same way that it is in the South, right? But what entrepreneurs and leisure resorts um, argue increasingly, right, is that um, white, their white patrons do not want to vacation with non-white patrons, and that as business people, they have the right and the responsibility to serve the needs of their customers, and therefore it gets framed as a kind of, uh, 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 segregation in the North gets framed as a sort of kind of property rights, right? The property rights of the business person to make their own decisions about what's best for their business. Um, and unsurprisingly, they often decide that segregation is what's best for their business. Not just African Americans, right? Um, Jews increasingly pushed out too. Um, this is the Lake Placid Club um, in, in the Adirondacks, um, a, a kind of a private club resort uh, started by Melville Dewey. Um, you may know him uh, famously as the author of the Dewey Decimal System. Um, more, better known in the Gilded Age as the guy who tried to simplify English spelling and failed. Um, <laughs> If you actually go to the, to the, to the uh, Lake Classic Club now, a lot of things are, are spelled very oddly um, as, a, um, uh, as a sort of a leftover from Dewey. The, the lodge is spelled L-O-J, because he, he, he believed in radical <laughs> simplification of English spelling. He did not achieve, he did not achieve that, I should say. Um, but he uh, started the Lake Placid Club, um, and, and he instituted a policy, right? And I'm gonna quote here from their 1895 prospectus. No one will be received as a member or guest against whom there is physical, moral, social, or race objection, or who would be unwelcome to even a small minority. This invariable rule is rigidly enforced. It is found impractical to make exceptions for Jews or others excluded even though unusual personal qualifications, right? So this increasingly in the 1890s, Jews are banned from, um, from um, resorts that, that Gentiles um, uh, uh, patronize. Uh, this is pretty common. The Lake Placid Club ends up becoming famous for this because uh, a bunch of prominent um, uh, Jewish business people, uh, Melville Dewey is the librarian of the State Library of New York. They try to get him kicked out in 1905 for being rampantly anti-Semitic and they fail. Um, but um, <laughs> so, so the Lake Placid Club is sort of becomes famous for this, but they are not at all um, unique, right? And so what you see, um, 
as a result of this growing, this creeping, increasingly uh, stringent segregation in this period, right, is that um, non-whites and non-Christians begin to build their own parallel vacation destinations, right, for themselves. Um, uh, Jews um, it begin to congregate um, in the 1870s, but especially in the 1880s and the 1890s um, in Sullivan and Ulster County in the southwestern Catskills, right? Um, where they build a, a, a whole sort of uh, area of these, these small resort hotels that are, that are specifically, right, uh, to cater to, uh, to Jewish New Yorkers, both uh, big fancy ones for, for wealthy people, um, as you see in the upper left there, right? Um, oh, and, and as well as, uh, you know, the, the Catskills, the Borscht Belt, as it is called, right, is characterized by um, a, a lot of quite small, modest hotels and bungalow colonies and that kind of thing um, for working class Jewish New Yorkers who are increasingly being pushed out of, um, out, out of uh, um, Gentile working class uh, leisure spaces. spaces. Um, the, the Borscht Belt, right, is, is characterized by um, uh, sort of an intense social life, right? Um, these little uh, resorts or, or uh, bungalow colonies, these cottage colonies, um, often have a dance halls. They're, they're generally called casinos, right? Um, and you can see in this postcard, there's the, the casino of this hotel on the upper left there, right? Um, uh, but it, historically, right, there's not, there's not a tradition of outside entertainment. Um, historically, it's much more, um, it's a tradition of, of the guests at the hotels creating their own entertainment, right, um, and putting on shows for each other, right. Um, there's a lot of sort of amateur theatricals and dances and masquerades and stuff like that that characterize um, a vacation in the Catskills. Later on in the 20th century, when these hotels get bigger and sort of fancier and better developed, um, they begin to hire professional entertainment um, for their casinos. Um, um, and that's where you get a real sort of important strain of, of 20th century um, sort of uh, theatrical talent. A lot of early Hollywood uh, talent comes out of the Borscht Belt. A, a lot of uh, 20th century sort of comedians uh, cut their teeth playing, playing the Borscht Belt circuit um, in the southwestern um, Catskills. But again, that's a little bit later. That's more in the, uh, uh, in the 20th century. How many of you guys have seen The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel? <laughs> right, yeah, she, goes, <laughs> she plays the Catskills, right? That's exactly it, yeah, exactly. Um, African Americans, right, um, also build their own uh, resorts as they're getting increasingly pushed um, out of uh, out of uh, white white seashore vacation spots, right. Um, sometimes they are sort of segregated beaches that are little um, uh, sort of nodes within larger uh, white beach vacation. There's uh, yeah, larger white beach vacation colonies, right. Um, this is a picture from the 1890s of, of black bathers in uh, Asbury Park, New Jersey, right, where there's sort of a section of the beach and a section of the town um, where they stay, right, where they, where they can go on the beach, um, and where black entrepreneurs emerge um, to run hotels and restaurants and, um, and uh, sort of nightclubs and that kind of thing to entertain black vacationers. Uh, sometimes they, they construct their own um, communities. Right. Um, this happens uh, famously on Oak Bluffs in Martha's Vineyard. Right. Um, there's a there's a, a, a historic uh, African American community on Martha's Vineyard that goes way back into the into the antebellum period. Um, but um, uh, in the turn of the 20th century, um, uh, sort of uh, particularly wealthier blacks from places like Boston and New York um, build a build a, a almost exclusively black vacation colony um, in Oak Bluffs. Uh, you see a similar thing. This is on the lower right here. This is Highland Beach, Maryland, um, which is uh, just south of Annapolis on the Chesapeake Bay. Um, <clears throat> and its uh, origin story is that um, uh, in 1893, Frederick Douglass's son had tried to go to a, a neighboring beach resort uh, on the Chesapeake Bay and had been turned away on the basis of his race. Um, and so he, he uh, came down the, down the shore a little ways, found a, a black farmer who owned some land that was waterfront, bought it from him, um, and then uh, established the, the um, community of, of Highland Beach um, as an exclusively black um, uh, beach vacation. And this is a picture on the lower right here um, from the uh, early 20th century of, of a, a croquet party um, in Highland Beach. All right. My time is at an end here, right? But I just want to leave you with a couple of uh, concluding thoughts. Um, the trends that we see in the Gilded Age, right, is increasing elite retreat in their leisure spaces, right, from Saratoga 
to Newport, to ultimately to the Adirondacks, right? As the wealthy in, uh, are sort of looking to exercise ever greater control, right, over who has access to their to their vacation spots, right, uh, up to literally buying themselves tens of thousands of acres in the wilderness, right? Um, you see the growth and the popularization of, of vacationing for, for working people, right, and, and also for, for non-white people, right, um, you know, in small ways, right, undertaken by, by philanthropists, usually for, for poor women and children first, right, um, as well as uh, working people um, uh, patronizing sort of day vacation spots, right, um, and also building their own, their own colonies. Um, I think you can really think of the, build, the Gilded Age as the sort of heyday of this fixed place vacation, right? The resort that I talked about at, at the beginning, right? The idea that you go somewhere, you stay, right? And then you don't, uh, and then you have your vacation there, then you leave, right? The, the Gilded Age is really sort of the heyday of that. Um, you begin to see the decline of that, right, into the early 20th century, particularly um, with the rise of the automobile, right? Makes it easier to go to a wider range of places and to vacation in multiple places at once, right? Later airplanes, of course, right, really change, uh, really change things. Um, I would argue that desegregation in the middle de decades of the 20th century really changes the vacationing landscape too, right, as a lot of um, older resorts um, get increased the, the sort of the historic segregation um, that, that dated from the 1880s and the 1890s begins to get uh, uh, sort of called into question in the 1950s and the 1960s. You see a lot of, of these historic resorts go down um, once uh, essentially white vacationers can't be assured of controlling that space anymore um, in the middle decades of the 20th century. Um, but this is really sort of the Gilded Age is that period, right? The kind of the heyday of that fixed place vacation, right? All right, and I will leave you with that thought, and I, we have time for some questions, Kate? All right, thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Hey. Um, I, you touched on this a bit at the end, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how some of these locations you've discussed have changed since the Gilded Age. Some of the what? Sorry, the... Some of the locations you've discussed and how they've changed since the Gilded Age. Okay, so the question is how some of these locations have changed since the Gilded Age, right? Um, I think that a, a lot of them, a lot of the places that, where the attraction was largely social, Right, have really entered a state of decline, right? Because I think that, that people don't m manage their sociability in the same way that they did in the Gilded Age, right? So you go visit Saratoga today, and it is a lovely place, and you can go for the races in August, and you can drink the water if you want. It's gross, but you are absolutely right. You can, you can still drink it. Um, but but it's, not, it's not Saratoga of the Gilded Age, right? Um, because I think that was a space that, that was constructed. The, the point of it was the sociability, right? Um, you know, I think the way that, that Newport has changed as a destination, I think, is reflective of that. Um, I think that you can, the rise of, of the automobile in particular, right, uh, created a whole new style of vacationing in the 20th century, right, um, that, that did, you know, sort of really incentivize people to move from place to place, right, and to consume multiple different kinds of spaces. And the, and the places that have the kind of natural appeal that make them a stop on a road trip are still important, right? Glacier National Park is still a place that people go to, right? Um, places that have that kind of, um, uh, that appeal, that road trip appeal, right? But, you know, people don't take the train to Glacier Park Lodge and stay for a month anymore, right? You know, they, they drive through on a, on a family RV vacation in the West, right? So I, I think that, um, you know, a lot of them are still thriving, right? Except. Um, I think with that real change of mode that comes with, with sort of changes in family life and the automobile and stuff like that in the 20th century, um, a lot of the places that had, had relied on, you know, getting people to come and stay for a while to hang out with each other have really entered a period of decline, at least as, as vacation destinations, right? Thank you so much for this talk. It was super interesting. 
Um, you spoke so much about access, um, particularly when you were talking about the railroad. And I was curious if you felt that all of this investment from Flagler and Huntington and control of the railroad was also a way for them to kind of have a consistent stream of customers for all of these hotels in places like Palm Beach and the Adirondacks as well. Yeah, oh, for sure, right. That's, I mean, I think it's a, it, by the 1890s, for sure, it's a strategy that goes hand in hand, right? Um, in the Adirondacks, I, I had mentioned um, uh, Durant as someone who was interested in early railroad building the Adirondacks in the 1870s. And like I said, he's not particularly oriented towards the tourist trade, right? He's very much thinking of, of, of mining. Um, but in the early 1890s, a, a much more significant railroad investment gets made in the Adirondacks by um, William Seward Webb who is married to a Vanderbilt. I'm not sure I could tell you which one off the top of my head. Um, uh, but uh, he um, uh, basically spearheads the construction of a railroad across the Adirondacks, um, which then gets linked in because it's made part of the larger New York central system um, that is basically you know, pretty much entirely right, devoted to, to leisure. Right? There's not a lot of people or commodities flowing on that other than um, uh, uh, you know, sort of Pullman cars, right, headed for, for um, great camp escapes, right? So yeah, you, um, but uh, to answer your question, yeah, they totally go hand in hand, right? For, for Flagler, he's absolutely like, these two things go together, right? And I think you see that with the, with the Great Northern example too, right? It's like, we gotta get people to ride our railroad, so let's, let's build some hotels in a pretty place and try to convince them that it's, you know, and then get it made a national park and have them convince it's like a trip to Switzerland or whatever, yeah. I've, I've exhausted you guys, which. <laughs> so much for your lecture tonight, Dr. McIntosh. And he will be outside on the loggia signing books as well. Um, so we would like to invite you tonight to a reception outdoors. Thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.